so uh, folks, we're a small group tonight, so actually we really can make this interactive. So in a way, this could work out quite well. Okay, so um, uh, we have some pretty ambitious goal tonight, goals tonight. We want to talk about some artificial intelligence in the context of regulation, but we're doing this. I have to make the assumption, though, for, for the purposes of this event we're having tonight, that that people do not have a prior background in medical device regulation. So we're going to strike a balance between covering some minimal background in medical device regulation so we can then have the discussion we would like to have uh, towards the end of our, our time here today, okay? All right, folks, so here, why don't I uh, share screen here? Okay. So uh, just you know, a little bit of eye candy, uh, just so uh, medical devices are not new in, in our civilization, the literal sense of the word. Now, this is the Cairo toe, Ahmed, going back to our discussion. Cairo toe uh, found in Egypt, 3,000 years old. And this is a prosthetic for the big toe uh, worn by, uh, in Egypt a long time ago. More recently, and by more recently, I say 500 years ago, we have this evil prosthetic uh, shown on the screen. Uh, you know, if you make a living bashing heads, this is a useful prosthetic. It actually, it, it actually has gears inside and ratchets. So, you know, it can clasp a mechanical object, uh, in this case, a sword or a mace. And uh, so uh, serve the purposes of the, war, uh, the user in this case, uh, if, you're, if your intended use is warfare. So um, we have ambitious goals. So we're going to talk about a little, a little bit about a lot of things here tonight. We're going to going to talk about some basics for medical device regulation. We're going to have to talk about a little bit screening and diagnosis. We're going to have to talk about a little bit digital health regulation. Once we've covered all that, um, um, we can then start to talk about AI and what's going on right now. So this is really the foundation of uh, medical device uh, regulation, which would, and so software is also considered a medical device or can be. Um, so this is really the foundation then for device regulation, software regulation, uh, and, and I, I mean software, I mean software as a medical device. So, uh, so what we have here are three risk classes, class one, class two, and, and class three. What I'm going to do here is, I always recall this about, uh, you know what I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just do it this way. I always find it easier to interact this way. And that way I can see uh, the gallery view of the Zoom. So class one, class two, and class three. Okay? So Q-tip swab, uh, dental imaging, uh, and then a cardiac stent. So risk class refers to the fundamental concept of should the medical device fail to work properly, what are the consequences for the patient? That's it, okay? This can be operationalized. This can be quantified. But when it's quantified, we call it a hazard score. But uh, so risk class then, so uh, class one is low because when we think about a Q-tip swab, if a Q-tip swab fails to work properly, is it gonna result in mortality? No. Is it going to result in, a, in a, a being admitted in the hospital? Extremely unlikely. On the other hand, when we talk about a cardiac stent, our answers to those questions are very different. A malfunctioning cardiac stent can easily be life-threatening, easily result in being admitted to the hospital. So that would be what we call a serious adverse event from a safety reporting perspective. And, um, and as a result of all of this, it's class three. Okay? So risk class, is about the consequences or the potential of injury for the patient should the device fail to work correctly. Okay? And all of medical device regulation comes back to one concept, I would argue. And that one concept is risk. It's always about risk. If We're a small group, guys. So if you have a question, feel free to go ahead and speak up, um, you know, whatever you feel comfortable with, because um, we're, we're intimate here. Okay? So... Sorry, Jason, I just sent yeah. an email to people and it looks like people are joining now. So I suspect there was something wrong. Uh, I, yeah, all I, good. I, yeah, it's all good now. Okay. Okay. Well, they missed the popcorn and, and donuts. That's, that's <laughs> all I have to say. <laughs> For those of you who already logged on, pretend like you were eating, okay, and you're just finishing up. Um, <laughs> so, so, uh, so this slide, uh, 
a lot of people in the clinical community, they have some develop familiarity with medical uh, drug regulation, but they have far less familiarity with medical device regulation. So typically when people are familiar with medical device regulation, this is what they're familiar with. Now, this is a core concept for medical device regulation. And so let's talk about it. So uh, this refers to the U.S. market. We are focused on the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Uh, and what we're going to talk about is the 510K approval pathway, which is a critical strategic option for the approval of new medical devices, which would include software. So here's the logic. You have a new device. And you don't really want to do all the safety testing and the efficacy testing that the FDA might normally require. So here's the argument you make. You're going to argue that your new device is very similar to a device the FDA has already approved. And, and that device you identify as being similar to your own is called a predicate. Okay? So a predicate is a device that is currently or has been on the market. And if that device, if you can argue that device is sufficiently similar to your own, then the FDA would agree, would agree if they do agree, then you can use this 510K approval pathway. And for our purposes, it means quicker time to market and it means simpler testing. So from a commercial perspective, the 510K is very relevant because it cuts down time to market and complexity of testing. So that's direct cost and indirect cost. So from a commercial perspective, of course, it's, it's fairly clear why that's relevant commercially because it's costs and cost reduction and, and quicker time to market. So if the FDA agrees that your new device is uh, very similar to a predicate that you've identified, then we call that substantial equivalence. I won't, in, in, I won't introduce much terminology tonight, but there is some terminology I have to introduce, okay? So, and this is important. So um, now I've shown the, uh, the picture here of Iron Man, uh, for those of you who may be familiar from, you know, the Marvel film. So this is a story of this genius who builds a suit of armor in his, in, uh, in his garage or cave the world has never seen before. So this is sort of antithetical to how medical device innovation actually works, of course, because medical device innovation relies on teams rather than really usually a single person. But it also, you know, um, in sharp contrast to what we like to depict in media, um, uh, advances in technology in the medical device space really mirror your experience with consumer electronics. It's incremental. So we don't usually find circumstances where someone releases a technology onto the world that we've never seen before. Now, maybe a good example where that, that has happened is recently with ChatGBT. So ChatGBT would be an example of a capacity for functionality that we've never really seen before, and it has not been incremental. Uh, but usually, though, with consumer electronics, it's incremental, and medical device, regu medical device submissions are very similar. It's incremental improvement over an existing uh, standard. So, um, so we're going to talk about a few pathways tonight because we're going to need to have them in our back pocket um, to kind of prepare us for a discussion of, of kind of uh, AI tonight. So we have a, let's start with a class two product. So if you remember going back here, a class two product is of low to intermediate risk. Okay, so we're going to start with a class two product. So we start with a class two product and we're going to ask yourself the question, what kind of regulatory pathway could this product go through in order to be approved and put on the market? So one option for the class two product is to go through the 510K pathway. 510K is good for low to intermediate risk products uh, where you can identify an appropriate predicate. And we go through the 510K pathway and we're on the market. If we want to modify this product, we'd submit another 510K. So we can go into that in more detail, but generally speaking, an original product approved by 510K can be modified and improved by submission of another 510K. What other direction could we go here though? What happens if we have a low to intermediate risk product, but there is no predicate? So examples of this that have come up even recently on the market are with uh, digital therapeutics. You know, there are apps out there now that that are by prescription only um, for PTSD and for sleeping disorders. 
And they did not have a predicate when they came to market. Okay. So what happens when you have a low to intermediate risk product, but there is no predicate? There's just no precedent for the kind of invention, if you will, or device or software that you've created. So the first step is we have to demonstrate that that is true. So NSC means not substantially equivalent. Okay. Again, uh, I have to introduce some acronyms, some terminology. This is quite common. Uh, NSC, not substantially equivalent. So we don't, we're not eligible for the 510K pathway because any predicate we identify, when we analyze that predicate, we find out it's really not similar to our own product. So if we fail the 510K pathway, in other words, we're not substantially equivalent, we can submit what's called a de novo submission. Okay? So the de novo pathway, and I always... I get a little bit anxious when I talk about this. This is this has the potential for abuse, and uh, and for people kind of new to the regulatory environment for devices, it can make things a little confusing because it can lead you to abuse as well. But the de novo pathway is for devices where there is no predicate. It is for low to intermediate risk products. So a low to intermediate risk product that does not have a predicate could use the de novo pathway. Okay? Now. Once we get a, a product on the market approved by the de novo pathway, if we modify it, we can then submit a 510K because we're going to use the original product by de novo submission as a predicate. So the new product here could use the earlier product as its predicate. So that's how we would modify this, uh, this line. Okay. Uh, it's always a little awkward by Zoom. Okay, So um, we're a small, intimate group. If you have a question, you can raise your hand or you can just unmute yourself and talk, guys, right? We're a pretty small group. So, um, so this can be a little bit much at first, but the, but the principles will have a little bit of an opportunity to acquaint ourselves over the next few slides. Now, I've been talking about risk and the fundamental analysis for, for risk is what we call hazard analysis. Okay. Unfortunately, the FDA, while they have what we call our guidance documents, or which are helpful in reviewing a lot of product issues, the FDA refers to risk analysis, but they provide very little by way of best practices on how to conduct that analysis. There are ISO documents, and I've cited the ISO document down the bottom of this slide that provide a little bit more detail on this, but it's still pretty scant. So here's the basic concept behind hazard analysis, and this is as far as we can go with this tonight. So we're going to take the frequency. So we're going to identify a hazard. So, so maybe the hazard is uh, the subject is confused uh, in using the device. Okay? So we identify a hazard. We're going to talk about the frequency of that hazard. And we're going to talk about the severity. So again, if we were doing a full table on this, we go through all the steps. We're not going to do that. But uh, for a subject confused in using a device, the resulting hazard could be uh, they administer the wrong dose or they, they uh, of the medication in question, or uh, they misuse the device and misjudge its power supply and expose themselves to some situations without access to power, um, which creates a whole new health risk for them. So, so we could be talking about over-administration of medication resulting from confusion. We could talk about uh, misunderstanding the device and, and its power supply and not receiving the therapy at the time that they should. So there's gonna be a severity of outcome there, what it represents for the patient to receive less ther subtherapeutic dosing or to miss uh, an application of their therapy. So we talk about the frequency of event times the severity of the health, come in, health outcome in question. So this is a unitless index. And this unit in, it, unitless index gives us a hazard score. Okay. So we generate a whole table here for hazard analysis and hazard analysis is used for a number of elements uh, behind our discussion tonight, but we're not gonna go down this rabbit hole any further than this. Suffice to say that hazard analysis is a fundamental analysis that regulatory authorities expect to see in analyzing risk. Now, uh, yeah, Sangeeta, go ahead. Uh, so hazard analysis, uh, as you said, that we are not going further, but just I have a quick question. Is it something like PFMEA or DFMEA? 
where we find out what are the chances, like what are the failure mode and then. Oh uh, yeah, so so with, if you're talking about failure mode uh, uh, evaluation, uh, analysis and evaluation, uh, it, it's a bit different. Um, so let's see, the problem with failure mode, the problem with fa failure mode is great when you know exactly what you're doing. Okay, so because the 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 in, the the primary starting point for failure mode analysis is a design flaw. So you might say, you know, uh, you, your starting point for failure mode might be, um, let's just say, you know, the surface or the coating of the device in question is not biocompatible, or the surface of the coating of the device in question causes rash or itch, uh, or you might your starting point for uh, failure mode might be the sensor in question has insufficient contact with the skin. So with failure mode analysis, you start with a fundamental design issue. And then from there, you, you talk about the healthcare consequences and do your workup. With hazard analysis, it's different. With, so let's take a, another example of hazard analysis, suicidal ideation. You're not gonna attribute suicidal ideation to a single design choice in a medical device. And as a matter of fact, chances are, if you're talking about suicidal ideation, you're not sure what it is about your device that might be leading to that, to that state. So a hazard analysis is really good when you don't have a kind of a mapping of the health, out health outcome and the design choice that's been made to create the product. So failure mode analysis is very good when you start from a design perspective and trace outcomes. Hazard analysis is very good when you start from hazardous outcomes but you don't know what the underlying design choices are that have generated them. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, so it's a good idea to do both. Um, hazard analysis is, I, I think, much more useful for products where you are kind of talking about complex health outcomes and you're not sure what aspects of your design are leading to those particular outcomes. So now let's talk about very high risk medical devices. So this would be, let's come back here, very high risk medical devices would be class three. Okay. So these are, if, if these products fail to work properly, the consequences are significant for the patient. So if we come to, um, if we go to uh, high risk device, uh, very high risk devices, class three, we have a um, class three product. Now there are some exceptions when I'm, when I'm, to so some of the slides I'm showing, but we don't have time for those rabbit holes. So I'm just kind of giving kind of the basic uh, template, if you will. So uh, he would start with a class three product and our only option for submission, generally speaking, there are some exceptions, but our only, generally speaking, <laughs> our only option for device, our device submission here is what we call a pre-market pre -market approval application. Okay? So a PMA, pre-market approval application. So the PMA is going to require clinical data. Um, it's, ex it's going to require extensive testing, extensive validation. Um, it's going to require clinical, and it's going to require extensive follow-up time. This is in sharp contrast to the 510K. Oftentimes, 510K submissions, they may not have clinical data. And if they have clinical data, it can be minimal. It can be, but not always. Uh, in the case of the PMA, you are absolutely required to have clinical data and, and, and your testing is gonna be much more demanding and your sample sizes will be much longer and your duration of follow-up may also be much longer. So from a commercial perspective, PMA is the most expensive regulatory option out there. So as you might imagine for a startup or a large company, when you're launching a new product, what you really wanna do is you wanna try and go with the 510K pathway. And if the 510K is not gonna work with you for you, go the de novo. But what you don't want to do, if you can avoid it, is the PMA. Okay? I'm speaking from a commercial perspective. I mean, you know, as an academic, I always like to see more evidence behind a product. But from a commercial perspective, obviously, you want to manage your costs. So you're going to submit a PMA. Now, for a PMA-approved product on the market, our next question becomes, if we modify the product, what's your submission? If we're making a minor change to a high-risk product that's already on the market, we're gonna do a PMA supplement. This could be a change in the parts, the, 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 the vendor or manufacturer for some parts for the, for the uh, device in question, a change in manufacturing itself, a change in sterility, or minor changes in design. 
If on the other hand, we're going to take an already approved high risk product on the market and we're going to make major changes to it, we're going to submit a PMA. So the first generation of the product was PMA approved. The second generation of the product is PMA approved because we're making additional major changes. Okay, so, so again, we're, we're kind of doing some highlights tonight in many different areas. So we're about to switch gears now and talk about a very confusing definition used by the, um, the FDA. And, and um, I realize this can be a little challenging for anybody learning this for the first time, okay? So anytime a drug or a medical device is approved, they have what's called a product label. And that product label um, tells us what the device can be used, what the device or drug can be used for. It tells us what kind of patient can be treated and what kind of benefits they can expect. Okay? So that product label is typically what we call an indication. So let's use an example. Let's say, you know, you've got a, um, I'm just checking our time here. You've got something that treats cancer. Well, treating cancer is a bit vague. Uh, what do you treat about cancer? Is it the anxiety? Is it the weight loss? Is it the bulk of tumor volume of, in the cancer patient? So when we use the term indication, it tells us very specifically what it is about the disease we're trying to treat. So medical devices though, use another term other than indication. So drug regulation uses the term indication all the time and so do medical devices. But medical devices use an additional term called intended use. And we're going to need to be familiar with this concept of intended use because of some issues that are going to come up later tonight, even for our short chat. So, so here we have, uh, and I'm going to editorialize this a little bit. I have here, for example, I have a, oops, I have a scalpel for say cutting skin in the, in the pelvic area. So very specific, we call that an indication. Here, I have a scalpel used in facial reconstruction. So hypothetically, very specific, and this would be an indication. Now let's talk about the intended use of the scalpel. What is the intended use? And so the intended use is a very general description of the device or software that incorporates the intended use sorry, the indications. So, so what is the intended use for scalpel? Cutting flesh, okay, we could say that. So, so maybe the intended use for the scalpel is, is cutting flesh. So very general term, very general description that's broadly inclusive of these two indications. Now, the FDA is going to ask the following question. Uh, in making your regulatory submission, are you changing the intended use of the device? So that can be a tricky question to ask, to answer. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about on this slide. So we've talked about what an indication is. We've talked about what an intended use is. So now we're going to answer the question, has my intended use changed? So let's go through a scenario. Let's pretend that we have our, our scalpel with the intended use of cutting flesh, it get, receives the indication, it's been approved for this, it's been approved for cutting uh, flesh in the pelvic area. And we plan to do a new submission for a scalpel specifically for use, say, in facial reconstruction. Now, I, I'm just gonna feel out the room here, but or the room, speaking figuratively. What do you think? Do we think cutting skin in the pelvic area represents the same clinical risks as Kelvin cutting skin in the facial area? Feel free to unmute yourself and chat, um, or you can put up your hand if you like, but we're small enough. You can just unmute and, and talk if you like. Uh, no, it's, it's, these two are two different uses. Intended use are different because cutting skin might have like this has some kind of sharpness, which, uh, which focused for certain uh, thickness, for example, but the facial reconstruction has some other kind of specs and which make it like in technical term, make these two different uh, uh, uses for this. I mean, intended uses. 
Okay, so so Sankita, thanks for that. That gets us started so started on this, and thank you. So, so one so these could be clinically very different applications, right? So, in the pelvic area, for example, the density of nerve innervation, the density of nerves down in the pelvic area is going to be nowhere near what it is in the face. So, in the face, we have much higher density of nerves in the face than we do in the pelvic area. So, any mistakes in cutting. Um, can have very dramatic repercussions for the patient for facial reconstruction, whereas mistakes in cutting in the pelvic area would have minimal implications for the patient. So put another way, the clinical risks in using a scalpel in the pelvic area are very different than the clinical risks of using the scalpel in the facial area. Put another way, the risk, the hazard analysis of, of using a scalpel in the facial area is going to have a, a much higher risk score than using the scalpel in the pelvic area. Because this is a much higher risk compared to this, because the facial area represents new clinical uncertainties, the FDA is going to say basically the intended use has changed. Okay? So even though conceptually where you're still using the scalpel to cut flesh, because we're introducing new clinical uncertainties and have dramatically in increased the risk from the indication in the pelvic area to the indication in the face, the FDA may consider this to be a change in intended use. Okay. So in summary, conceptually, the definition, if you will, of the intended use may not have changed here. But what has changed is we introduced new clinical risks that were not contemplated by or reflected in simply describing the use of the scalpel to cut pelvic skin or skin in the pelvic area. Okay, so so let's, uh, yeah, sure, Sangeeta. Uh, just a question about one slide I have before you mentioned about the minor changes. So if, for example, minor changes, one thing I understood, if it is not changing anything in the intended use, it is minor change. So can, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a major change. So if, for example, if we are changing something with the same thing, if this uh, scalpel, if we are changing something in design or the way um, they hold it, does, and but it is not changing anything in the blade size where we cut it, does it, coming, uh, would it come in the minor change or major change? Okay, so you may be uh, going bigger picture with your question, which is good. Uh, I think what you're getting to is, and we're not getting into this tonight, but but I think what you're getting into is here, okay? So when, you, when you're when you gonna argue that your new device is similar to a predicate, you have to look at several categories for your analysis. One is going to be, has the intended use changed? So that'll be a point of discussion. Another is going to be, are there significant design differences between the respective products? Another will be, the other two will be safety and efficacy. Are there significant changes in the performance of the product or the safety of the product? So, so when you talk about minor changes, well, there can be a minor change with respect to intended use uh, which can be fine if it's a minor change in intended use. Intended use is not changed, so the FDA is happy. But when you talk about a minor change, you also may be talking about a ch minor change to safety or minor change to efficacy or minor change to design. And in order to answer those questions, that's part of another framework, which we're not going into at the moment or, or tonight, but you have to conduct a substantial equivalence analysis. And the substantial equivalence analysis will look at the four categories I just mentioned. So intended use, design, safety, and, and efficacy. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, all right, thanks, Angita. So I realize um, uh, I, I'm gonna see if I can, I encourage other a uh, little participation more broadly from our group, um, just because I wanna make sure you're kind of comfortable with this before we move on. And we're gonna have a break soon, guys. So what we're, here's what we're gonna do. We're going to have, we're going to do this little exercise for about, I don't know, you know, give or take 10 minutes, and then we'll take like a 15 minute break. Okay. Because uh, I am well aware after three years of COVID that uh, um, Zoom fatigue. <laughs> okay. So, so what we're going to start here with, we're going to start with a class two product. Okay. So who knows, it could be a new medical app, it, 
It could be a uh, uh, new piece of uh, new dental imaging equipment. Um, it could be uh, some sort of relatively invasive diagnostic uh, medical device. I'm gonna start with class two. What are the possible options here to bring a class two product to market? So this is gonna be the first generation. Up here, I have the first generation. And on the right, I have the second generation. So a class two product, we're gonna bring this to market. What are our options here? We could maybe use 510K, maybe PMA. Um, uh, what, uh, yeah, fair enough. Oh, yeah, we talk about PMA supplement, gotcha. Any thoughts? So low to intermediate medical device, low to intermediate risk medical device, we're bringing to the market for the first time. What pathway might we use? De novo. Okay, let's 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 give that a shot here. So de novo. Okay. So that's so if we say so that's interesting. So if we say you put them on attached, we can see so we don't know what I'm sorry, sir. Uh, uh, it's a problem with Zoom. It's a problem with digital. It's it's easy for us to speak over each other. Um so with de novo, uh with de novo. De novo could be an option. Okay? In order for de novo to work, though, we'd have to first demonstrate that the 510K didn't work. So what we could do prior to de novo, and I'm going to kind of shift it, what we could do prior to getting to the de novo, I'm going to shorten this. We want to first demonstrate that we failed the 510K analysis. So our first generation, it's a little crowded here, but uh, yeah, I can't really make that much smaller. So, so in order to use a de novo pathway, we'd have to show that we have no predicate, no reasonable predicate on the market. So for that to work, the manufacturer would conduct their own substantial equivalence uh, uh, tests and demonstrate by taking the most reasonable predicate on the market, it fails this test, the predicate is not sufficiently similar to their own product. So they do that analysis, and once they've concluded the 510K will not work, then they can submit the de novo submission to the FDA. And that would be your first generation product. Okay, okay so cool. Okay. So de novo can work, provided we first demonstrate that we fail the 510K pathway. Okay. Now, since we're on the de novo, what uh, what could we do here? What happens now? Our first generation product is by de novo. Okay, so low to intermediate risk product. We went through the de novo pathway because there was no predicate out there that was really similar to our invention. Now we're going to do the uh, second generation product. What might be available to us if we're going to if we're going to create a second generation product um, of this originally de novo approved product? What could we do? Is it PMA? Five ten K. PMA. PMA. All right. So let's let's see here. So we take PMA. Let me put that up there. Okay. Now PMA is possible, but there's an assumption there. Okay. And what is that assumption if we're going to use PMA? Or what would what would have to be true for a PMA to be warranted here? Would the change we're making to this product have to be big or small? The so the change is not affecting intended use. That's the well, it's the it, it the, the change could be affecting any number of things, Sangita. So it come back to substantial equivalence analysis. It could affect the safety, the efficacy, the design of the product, or the intended use. Any one of those things. Well, so when I refer to change, it could affect any of those categories. Okay. So coming back here, um, would the change have to be a small change or a big change for us to use a PMA? Uh, a higher risk change, maybe like to yeah. change the class. Okay, good. So, so if I understand what you're saying correctly, we need a high risk change, which is probably going to be a big change to the device. Okay, so it could be a small change leading to high risk, but more likely a big change leading to high risk. So, if we take this de novo approved product and and make a design to it that introduces a lot of risk to the product, absolutely, it would be a PMA submission. What might be another, so PMA can work then if we're making a high risk change. What be, might be another pathway we could use here? 
another deliverable, maybe. Okay, interesting. You guys are choosing some interesting options here. Okay, so de novo. So we can do another de novo. What would have to be true if we use another de novo submission? Uh, like the second generation is not uh, substantially equivalent to the first one. So like major change, but not with a high risk. Okay, good. So this would be tricky. Okay, so, so absolutely. You could use a de novo if the change you're making is not high risk, but is big enough such that you can no longer use the first generation of your product as a predicate. That's possible, okay? I haven't seen that situation yet, but it's possible. So good. Okay. Um, and what's the third possibility for the modification of this product line? We've talked about PMA, we've talked about DeNovo. What other submission might we use? Could you use the 510K using the DeNovo as a predicate? Absolutely. Okay. 510K using the de novo as a predicate. Absolutely. Okay. Good stuff, guys. All right. Listen, I want to be mindful of Zoom fatigue. We're going to take a 15 minute break. So uh, let's resume at five past the hour. Okay. Five past the hour.